So welcome, guys. I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Bennell. I'm uh, one of the attendings in rehab at Harborview. I'm a new attending. Been there for three years, but did my residency uh, here and did my medical school at UCSF. Um, and I've been asked to just basically go over five areas in rehab. It's, uh, it's surprisingly hard to do uh, short talks on five different subjects in a way that's concise, um, but we will, we'll see what we can do. And I thought kind of through the areas that I've found most exciting and that I've really enjoyed reading about and implementing into clinical practice um, at Harborview um, are these five. The first two I'm sure that you're already familiar with, but I wanted to dive into the evidence a little bit because um, I was told this was for the residents mainly. Um, and then uh, I wanted to go over a little bit of some of the changes that we are seeing in, um, the, uh, in the healthcare environment and uh, the AHA and ASA recommendations. I really think this is a new area and something we need to think about. Um, and then we can have a little more fun, get into some robotics and talk about virtual therapy. I can cruise a little closer to this. So this is an area that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, and, you know, a lot of small initial trials in China and uh, various places uh, started showing some slight improvements even after one. I think I'm just going to turn this down just a touch so we don't get as much feedback. Um, the, you know, even a single dose of citalopram showed improvement in the nine-hole PEG test, single dose of fluoxetine, improving finger tap speed and a handheld dynamometer. Uh, interesting results, but not really conclusive. And I think, you know, they, the, the next question was, we need a big randomized study to evaluate this in uh, stroke. So the FLAME trial uh, came out uh, in uh, 2011, 118 patients, a well-done trial, ischemic CVA within five to 10 days of the event um, with hemiparesis or plegia with Fulgemeyer motor scale less than 55. And then exclusion criteria, and this is important, they excluded depression, uh, and hemorrhagic CVA, another important, uh, and then really severely disabled um, prior CVA, and then severe aphasia. So this is just looking at the baseline characteristics, making sure they're similar, and they're, they're pretty close. Um, no statistically significant differences, but you might argue that in the fluoxetine, the Fogelmeyer stroke score was a little better, maybe a different prognosis in that group, um, but overall pretty similar. Uh, and maybe a little bit uh, worse in terms of uh, modified uh, uh, ranking in terms in the, uh, in the placebo group. So the intervention was 20 milligrams uh, fluoxetine every day for 90 days, and they had great compliance. So I think the validity of that is is good. Uh, no significant loss to follow up, and clearly randomized study well done. We. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I'll personally you. send you the email. You want? <laughs> it's all right. I gave a brief <laughs> intro. I'm Dr. Bunnell. So I think that's all they need. Um, so, in terms of flame outcomes, and we're just for you guys coming in, we're going through SSRIs and motor recovery after stroke. Um, the the outcomes, you know, did show an impressive improvement in Fogel Myers. Uh, uh, motor score, so 34 points versus 24 points uh, overall, and then also holding up in individual limbs. So, you know, nice uh, differentiation between the groups. We don't have a study going out to 180 days, out to 200 days, out to 360 days to see if those changes hold up, but uh, it's a nice uh, demonstration of, of the concept. It's great that you see these, you know, improvements in motor score. The question that we have oftentimes is it functionally significant because that's you know strength does not necessarily equal function. Are they more spastic? Are you know you know are they really able to actually convert that improvement in muscle strength into function? And the way that they kind of looked at this was through the modified Rankin score, which is maybe not the most detailed assessment of function, but gives you some idea. And they looked at you know, modified rank in, in that zero to two range and then also in the three range. This is often about the group that we're looking in at the inpatient rehabilitation candidates. So people that are coming to rehab, this is our goal for them is to get them. Obviously, we'd like to have that zero to two, but, you know, at least to three. 
And what was interesting is the proportion of patients achieving that real independence, so those zeros to twos, um, was significantly higher in the fluoxetine group. And patients, um, you know, 26 independent, I'm sorry, independent living, uh, 26 versus 9%. So you're seeing real functional improvements. And you can look, you know, just holistically at the fives. It doesn't look like there's huge changes in the patients that are really severely disabled. And my guess is that if you're really severely disabled, another one or two points in motor uh, function doesn't really give you that extra. But if you're on that edge of being able to walk independently, you get enough strength, you might be tipped over that edge from the three to the two. Complications, a lot of digestive order, disorders, uh, abdominal pain, et cetera, um, but not significantly different. You might see it if you did a bigger study that the difference would be significant. No noted difference in bleeding complications, which is something many were worried about, and we'll get to that in a little bit. They spend a, a fair bit of time in their discussion defending why this is not, you know, treating just depression. So, and one of the things that I got from the FLAME study is that I wasn't treating depression enough in my rehab population. I, I was, I, I took away from the, the frequency of depression in the fluoxetine group being 7% versus 29% that I was not diagnosing this enough and that I needed to be more rigorous about how I was diagnosing that. And they've, you know, in their discussion, they talk about, um, you know, potential mechanisms. You know, are you reducing uh, inflammation? Are you modulating blood flow? Are you improving neurogenesis into ischemic areas? Those kinds of things. At this point, I think that's a little bit hand waving. Um, I don't think we actually know, uh, but I, I think that's an important point to take home from this trial as well. Does this hold up for other SSRIs? A fairly large meta-analysis in 2013 looked at uh, fluoxetine, uh, sertraline, citalopram, paroxetine, and you know, with the exception of uh, paroxetine, all um, I'm sorry, except for citalopram, all uh, were significant. The the trend was definitely towards uh, benefit in the citalopram group, um, except with the exception of one study. So it's likely not necessarily that you have to do fluoxetine. Only. So looking a little bit more closely at complications, um, so in this uh, meta-analysis looking at, uh, also looked at the complications, they, they found that the bleeding, the relative risk was 1.63. Um, uh, so, you know, that is one of our main concerns with this. However, you're also seeing that death uh, is, is less likely in that group as well. So. Um, we were wondering, you know, with the potential for bleeding in SSRIs, if that would be one of the, the complications that would be concerning in this group. There is evidence in other areas with that SSRIs increase bleeding. So gastrointestinal, postpartum, surgical, uh, epistaxis, all um, suggest that there's a, an increased uh, odds of having a bleed while on SSRIs. These are all observational retrospective studies, so it's harder to control. Um, one more relevant to us is the analysis of the incidence of cerebral hemorrhage uh, in people taking SSRIs and definitely an increased uh, both unadjusted and adjusted for intracranial and intracerebral <coughs> hemorrhage in these groups. So it does look like SSRIs have some effect, but we also are using a lot of you know, medications in stroke which can cause bleeding as well, so maybe it's not as a concern. Recently, you know, our practice on the rehab floor has been not to prescribe SSRIs in hemorrhagic stroke. And our question was, are we going to start doing that? And we didn't have any randomized evidence. Recently, an article came out of India randomizing 89 patients with hemorrhagic stroke only to patamin and thalamus, which I wasn't quite sure why they chose that. Um, but otherwise, it's essentially the same inclusion criteria um, using Fulamire, um, hemiparesis, and then exclusion criteria, almost the same, depression, uh, severe disability, prior stroke, prior disability. And they also found that they did have an increase in uh, Fulamire motor scores uh, at 90 days compared to placebo group and about, this, about the same. Um, they didn't find any diffi uh, significant difference in the mean modified Rankin 
um, scale, uh, but they did say that there was a trend towards more people with the zeros or twos in fluoxetine. Importantly, they didn't, they, although they described an increase in epigastric pain, nausea, insomnia, they didn't report any in bleeding events, and they don't even actually discuss it in their paper, which kind of seemed like the whole point of doing this study. Uh, so it was a little, it made me a little nervous that maybe they weren't running the best study or thinking about this in the, the most clear way. Um, and they also had five patients lost to follow-up where they didn't do any sensitivity analysis or anything uh, to, to try to account for that. I actually want to talk to you guys sometime about what you're thinking in terms of what this paper means for stroke and follow-up. So I'm, I'm still not convinced. Um, so, yeah. Improvements, the motor improvements with a single dose of SSI, were those individuals with stroke or healthy volunteers? They were with stroke. Yeah. stroke. Mm -hmm. Do healthy volunteers in delay that kind of motor? Oh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I don't know. That's an interesting question. I mean, it could speak to, I mean, I've always thought it was impressive and we don't talk about it, but it's not for therapy or anything that that's been sort of applied for. I hadn't thought about it. Even if that were the case, healthy volunteers. In, in light of the, the Rio Olympics, we might consider doing that study. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we'd, it, it would, I, that's an interesting question. I'll look that up, actually. I've never seen that. I, I, bet, I bet the Russian, well, I bet, the, I bet if it's known that, the, that there will be some athletes on it. Um, in traumatic brain injury, I haven't seen any evidence for that. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I don't know. I haven't looked that up. Yeah. You know, has anybody done a crossover design? And uh, that would answer the question of sustaining the effect and whether it really I haven't seen that, like, you know, the amantadine and TBI. Um, that would be great, though. Yeah. And the next area I thought that's really interesting is early mobilization. This is an area that I'm doing a lot of research in the ICU um, and trying to get people uh, <coughs> mobilized, you know, even still on ventilators, even still uh, really critically ill. Um, <coughs> What we're finding is immobility is bad for the whole body. You know, in the 1950s, if you had a heart attack, six weeks bed rest. You know, we just laid you down. Uh, if you were pregnant and you had a baby, we should probably give you at least a month in the bed. Um, and we made people really weak. And then the VA, they started not having beds, so they had to get people up and moving. Well, the people that you know couldn't afford to keep a bed uh, actually did better. So we started finding, well, maybe we shouldn't keep people in bed for six weeks. Um, very, very simple. Because we have the physiology of immobility. If you ask Scott Kelly, um, in, you know, in his anti gravity environment, you have a lot of decrease in muscle mass, decrease in strength, change in your mitochondrial and oxidative capacity, and you also uh, decrease bone intensity, decrease contractile strength of myocardium, all of these things. Um, the, you know, there's been a lot of early mobilization in the ICU. Uh, and studies on that and looking at how these patients do. The Schweikert uh, study from 2009 enrolled 100 patients and they were randomized to PT and OT versus kind of routine care, which included PT and OT, but much later in the course. And um, you know, the primary outcome was independence with ADLs and ambulating 100 feet. And what they found is in the intervention, and this is big, 59% of the people in the intervention were independent at discharge versus the control of 35%. That's huge. That means you're not sending you know, your loved one to the skilled nursing facility or the LTAC or to my floor. Um, your, uh, you know, your distance walk to discharge, not that much different, but 33 meters on a vent is pretty good. Um, decreased IC delirium, so two days versus four days if we got you up. And there's a lot of theories for that. Maybe it's because to get you up, we had to take you off your midazolam drip that you were so agitated on. Um, and then ICU acquired weakness also uh, substantially decreased. More interesting for the hospitals and the payers was that the, the duration of mechanical ventilation went down, overall hospital length of stay went down. There was a non-significant trend towards improved mortality. Can we apply this to stroke? Um, is this the same principles uh, employed? You know, many of our stroke guidelines in 2015, in reviewing 30 of these guidelines, they recommend um, early mobilization in 22 examples. What early mobilization 
is is often not special specified. So, you know, is that within 12 hours of a stroke? Is that within a day? Is that within three days? Um, you know, there's some potential advantages in stroke. Maybe there's a narrow window for brain plasticity and repair. We need to get you working on your activities and get you up. Um, yeah, maybe you'll be less likely to get DVTs, contractures, things like that. Um, and then all the other effects on the musculoskeletal system. But we could also say you're more likely to fall. You might be reducing cerebral perfusion if we get you up and your blood pressure drops. We're no longer perfusing your brain. Um, and then you might have other you know, issues of re-bleeding um, or uh, thrombolysis after you know, ischemic stroke. The other question that hospitals often ask is, can we do this? Is, do we have enough staff to actually get people up? So the AVERT trial um, was really looking at the safety of uh, and efficacy of very early mobilization within 24 hours of onset, which is a pretty impressive timeline. Big study. I'm, I'm impressed with how they organize this. 2,100 patients. So the inclusion were first or recurrent hemorrhagic or ischemic stroke. Um, within 24 hours, if you didn't respond to voice, they didn't include you just because of the obvious difficulties of immobilization. And then other serious illnesses, uh, previous significant disability, and blood pressure parameters that so would keep you. It, that's prior. So if, if you were really disabled for, came in with another mm -hmm. stroke, then the, you were excluded from this. And if you look at this intervention, so begin within 24 hours of onset, and their average intervention is at 18.5 hours, which is really impressive. I'm not sure that we're doing that anywhere in our system. Um, I'm also impressed that their usual care is 22.4 hours, which is also very, very fast. Um, their main focus was on sitting, standing, and walking. Uh, they had at least three out-of-bed uh, sessions in addition to their usual care. And uh, mobilization was done by physical therapy and nursing. And mobilization um, was stopped if, if they had a greater than 30 millimeter uh, drop of uh, mercury on the uh, systolic blood pressure. So, and their primary outcome, and we can debate whether this is a reasonable outcome, was that modified ranking of that zero to two, you know, so completely independent in your ambulation um, and in your self-care. Uh, so they found that 46% of the very early mobilization and 50% of the usual care obtained favorable outcomes. So they in the adjusted analysis, when they adjusted for age and baseline, they saw a significant difference. In the unadjusted, it was not a significant difference. So similar results when they did the sensitivity analysis. And I think you, know, you can kind of see that when you're really in the severe areas, they're fairly similar. It's really in the middle ground that we start seeing differences. But they didn't see significant differences in deaths proportion of the patients achieving unassisted walking by three months, and the number of non-fatal serious events at three months. Um, and then when you look at the time to walking, I mean, it, I'm not sure I could draw two lines that were more similar by hand, so it, it's pretty, pretty close in the two groups. Of note, there was a trend in the severe stroke and the hemorrhagic strokes towards worse outcomes. So I, I think noting that is, is going to be important going forward as we think through which patients we're mobilizing early and, and thinking about. And getting to the critiques, so I think the, the main challenge I have with all these intervention studies, these early mobilization studies, is I don't actually know what people did. So when you, did you get him up and walk him, you know, 50 feet, did you get him up and sit in a chair for an hour? I, I really don't know what the exact intervention you did was. And that's true in the ICU early mobilization studies. And it's really just, you know, we did a little more therapy. We did it three times. We did it more frequently. But we didn't actually specify what we did. I think you need a more granular understanding to understand what is getting your outcomes. The other thing, you know, 
in rehab, we're pretty happy with a modified <coughs> ranking of three. Um, people do fairly well with that. You know, it, it's this modified ranking scales a little bit of a broad assessment of recovery. And I think something more uh, graduated like the extended bar dollar index would give you a more clear idea of what people are actually doing. Um, and if you choose three, this also doesn't seem to make, I, I, it would be unlikely to be a, a, diff, a significantly different uh, outcome. The other thing is, is this really a trial of early mobilization? Yeah, I mean, I, 18.5 hours versus 22.4 hours. I mean, that's an amazing early mobilization intervention um, either way. And if, you know, if we have this at our hospitals, we high five and are very excited at, the, at, at achieving that early mobilization. I think maybe what this is a trial of is how much you got or how frequent you got it. Um, so, you, you know, total amount per person is 201. So maybe what we're saying is, you know, that if we're doing that intensive of intervention early on, that that is, you know, creating a slightly worse outcome. Maybe we shouldn't have these people up quite as long or doing quite as much this early on. The other thing is that there was the follow-up care in these groups. Uh, it seemed like the the barely early mobilization group um, got a lot less inpatient rehab and a lot less therapy overall afterward. So I'm not sure that, you know, if you're, they didn't really provide an analysis of what those therapy interventions were, were they statistically significant in terms of differences, but it makes me wonder if you know, maybe that group was benefiting from that additional therapy. This is a good one to look up if you have time. So they, I think when you do a big study like this and you only get that small of difference, you really want to get something out of it. So they went back and used regression analysis and uh, CART analysis, which I am not familiar with, um, but to investigate the kind of timing and dose of mobilization outcomes. So they brought the whole group back together and then stratified based on uh, frequency or uh, uh, the interventions uh, that were actually, uh, I'm sorry, the frequency or the amount of intervention and by patient. And what they came to the conclusion was maybe frequency of mobilization may reduce disability, but then if you did longer sessions over a more significant amount of time, that you had higher odds of that, a higher odds of, of death and more morbidity. And here's their, their kind of a graph. So in frequency, they, they had some favorable uh, outcome of walking uh, uh, unassisted 50 meters and favorable outcome for um, uh, overall for the modified rank. And, and if amount, if you got more therapy, you had a, a, a worsening odds ratio of that. So, and this was true also of uh, deaths. So if you did a frequent intervention, you had less chance of of death um, overall versus the, the more intensive interventions. So what should we do? Um, I'm not sure we know exactly from this article. I'd really like to know, I would have preferred a randomization of, you know, before 24 hours and maybe at 24 to 48 with very clear ideas of what was the intervention, but I think we're, we're still you know, I, I, I probably wouldn't, I would say you don't have to intervene incredibly early. You don't have to intervene necessarily in severe or hemorrhagic stroke this early. Is the first trial, they conferred on any other radical effective mobilization on medical complications like BC or I didn't, I didn't see those, no, in their trial. I don't know if they have it in their data or not, if it was in their collection, but I didn't see it in their supplementary. Has there been a cost-benefit analysis? Yeah, I, I, I think I haven't seen the cost of benefit analysis, but I, I can pretty much guarantee what it will be based on those results. Um, it's there's not a huge difference between those groups, and clearly, you know, 200 minutes of therapy versus you know 35 is, is going to be more expensive. So, um, so recently, the AHA and ASA came out with the first guidelines for rehabilitation um, 
uh, after stroke, uh, which is kind of stunning to me. I, I would assume that this would have all been kind of planned out way before I even arrived on this field, um, but glad to be here when it did. Um, so, and they stated that it's recommended that stroke survivors who qualify and have access to inpatient rehabilitation uh, receive treatment um, in an inpatient unit in preference to a SNF. That's an interesting question. We'll, we'll get we'll get to that in just a second. This is kind of the downer part of the talk. You guys can feel free to grab coffee or something during that. Yeah, the evidence behind this recommendation. So there's been you know some observational evidence that inpatient rehab patients, when compared to SNF, have higher rates of return to community living, greater functional recovery lower rehospitalization rates and better survival. It's all based on observational studies. So it's really hard to separate out those baseline differences because those patients are going to SNF versus rehab, better social circumstances, more money, um, you know, and functionally are probably better too. So we're, you know, trying to control uh, for those is, is, uh, is going to be a really challenge. Um, that said, there are a couple or uh, a few studies that look at this. Um, Chan in 2013 uh, did a prospective longitudinal cohort study of 222 patients in patient rehab versus SNF or home health. And the functional scores were at least eight points higher um, in, the, uh, in the inpatient rehab unit. And then Wong in 2013 did a retrospective study and subjects who received greater than three hours of therapy daily made significantly more functional gains than those receiving less than three hours daily. You know, it, it would be great to have a large randomized study that looked at this. My guess is that that study is not going to be done. Um, I think it should be, but it, it, it probably will not be. I get the feeling that patients really look forward to getting onto the rehab service, but if you tell them they're going to go to the SNF, they think they can. That, that, and in some cases, that is the, you know, if you go to Ida Culver, you're not being abandoned, you're getting great therapy go to Seattle Medical Rehab, you've been abandoned. Your society has decided that you are not worthy of intervention. And that that is the kind of harsh reality of this. And I it, it's, it kind of weighs heavily on my mind every time I make this decision. Um, so, and guess what? It's not getting better um, in terms of financial questions. So the Obamacare and, and healthcare reform have created ACOs and bundled payment uh, systems. Um, and there's becoming a financial incentive to provide post-stroke care and skilled nursing facilities. Um, and I've seen in Washington managed Medicaid plans that a lot of this medical decision making is also falling on people who are not even trained in neurology or rehab or any management of stroke. There may be a family medicine doc um, or they're using some proprietary algorithm, which I don't know what is goes into that algorithm that decides where my patients go, but that is definitely becoming a, a, a factor, and I, I'm finding that I'm having to spend a lot of time fighting with insurance companies to justify uh, whether a patient should come to rehab or not. Um, and it's really interesting, too, that we're seeing a lot of, well, you, you know, you, if you go to rehab, then you can't go anywhere else. You know, we have these patients, you know, there's some patients you're 100% sure you're going to get them home. Great family, great support, great functional prognosis. And there's some that you're 100% sure they're never going to get home. And then there's this group that maybe you're 80% sure they can get home, but 20% chance they're not going to be able to do that. If they come to my unit now in that 20% instance that they couldn't get home, then the insurance company will not pay for them to go to a SNP to get more gradual therapy. So it's, it's becoming a little challenging. And then inpatient rehab units are actually shrinking in terms of overall numbers with a slight uptick last year. Um, but they're, you know, they're expensive. Uh, it's a lot, of, uh, a lot of money to intervene. And I think you know, people are looking at that as a, a potential area to save costs. So we're seeing a lot of efforts to cut costs in post-acute care. And I think a lot of people are not necessarily thinking about what the functional outcomes are, what the patient outcomes are. They're really thinking about what is the cost of this care. And I know you're neurologists, and I probably should have chose a stroke case, but I chose this 
SCI case because it really illustrated to me what is going on at times. And this patient actually came to Harborview. We had a consult on how to manage SCI, uh, and she had a large stage four sacral decube and found out she hadn't been in inpatient rehab. And I was trying to figure out why. And I was, I looked at the case and that the, she'd been denied because she had a complete cervical injury and she had no chance for functional recovery. And I, I was just kind of stunned. Like this lady has basically been banned, banned into a small sniff. And at that sniff, they let her get her sacral DQ, stage four. Um, she had autonomic dysreflexia, which she was put on standing antihypertensives for. So for her occasional spikes due to her sacral DQ, she's on these antihypertensives. Now they can't mobilize her to her chair, which is actually better for her because of the location of her sacral DQ. She passes out every time she gets up. Her joints are contracted. She's in a poorly fit wheelchair. It doesn't fit at all. Um, and she's in incredible pain, and she can't even get up for even more than 30 seconds. And I, we fought really hard, eventually getting our lawyers to talk to this insurance company because they were, they, they were convinced that the sacral D-cube was going to get worse if we did rehab. But her sacral D-cube was in a place that if we sat her in the chair, it was offloaded. And we did pressure mapping and all this elaborate stuff to convince these guys. And then, you know, six weeks later, she's sent home. And, you know, she's still... She's able to get around in her chair. She's not in pain anymore. She's not passing out. She's, you know, got a bowel and bladder program, so she's continent, all these things. And it, you know, that decision was made by one person in this machine that didn't know anything about spinal cord injury. And we see that happening with stroke, TBI, spinal cord injury, that, you know, whoever is managing at this, this care facility is, is making these decisions. Sorry to bring you all down, but it's, it's really, really starting to get... And in the AHA ASA statement, they report that, you know, they, they had one kind of very clear summary that, you know, as our systems of care evolve, these systems are looked at as costly areas of care to be trimmed, and they're not really thinking about clinical impact. And the provision of comprehensive rehabilitation programs with adequate resources, dose and duration, is an essential aspect of stroke care. And really should be a priority. And I, you know, if it's your own family member, I think you really want them to get this rehab. I'm totally open to ways of reducing costs as long as you're maintaining functional outcomes. I'm, if, if we decide that we can achieve the same functional at home at home with home therapies and you know other structured interventions, I'm very open to that. But you know, I, I, it's just kind of wholesale cost cutting is making me a little fatigued. Um, in terms of what my request to you is, when you're sitting on boards or when you're seeing these kinds of decisions being made, um, please advocate for this kind of care, uh, or at least uh, you know have a voice in it. I'd really like like that. All right, now that I've brought everyone down, um, let's actually get to some fun things to talk about. One of the things I think that's really becoming exciting in rehab is technology, and everybody always you know, oh technology, technology. Um, and you know, robotic technology, it, you know, this question is, is this new? I, no, this has been going on for a long time. But it, what really is new is the level of miniaturization and the applications that are being developed that I think are going to help us to, uh, to really help either one with therapeutic approaches or with uh, functional approaches. So there are many potential areas of interest um, Therapeutic people are looking at, especially at upper limb function and gait, um, but also at cognition, pain, range of motion, um, psychologic, and uh, motivation. And we've been seeing this in the burns population and in our stroke populations, as well as our spinal cord injury population. I'm perhaps more excited about the functional aspects because I think it's very hard to beat our therapists in terms of the functional interventions. Um, it may be that eventually the cost will come down enough in robotics that they can beat our therapists, but it's hard to mimic what they do. Uh, functional outcomes, though, if we can get the cost of these devices down significantly and get their miniaturization, their comfort down enough, then I think they can actually help quite a bit with our functional approaches. I wanted to show you. Head. Research shows that intensive 
motivating therapy is the key for successful recovery. This is where Hakuma's Armeo therapy concept provides clinically so effective see, this solutions for arm is three and different options here. On the right is a powered robot, which provides active assist in any direction you want it to go. In the middle is a passive device, which is partly off-weighted by springs and uh, weights to give you better function. Um, and then on the left is, uh, I don't know what the left thing is, it looks like a, something you can jerry-rig in your house, um, but I, I'm not that impressed with this device. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, but what they're doing with these is that they're having these systems connected to uh, games that people are playing online um, or on the screen and uh, manipulating the arm. And you can set the arm to require different levels of strength and output from the patient. And uh, you can take minimal movements and create them into kind of more full movements with the patient. Through self-directed training and group settings. Hokoma's Armeo therapy concept, placing recovery within reach. So I, it's, everyone's excited about fancy toys, and these are pretty big, expensive, fancy toys. Um, are you know are they going to work? So there's a, a smaller RCT of 54 patients um, looking at 30 minutes on this Armeo um, versus third and at plus 30 minutes of therapy versus 60 minutes of therapy, uh, five days a week for six weeks, and what they found was that there was really no difference in the between the arms in terms of uh, improvements in uh, FIM, strength, pain, spasticity, uh, and that everybody improved. Uh, what I think is impressive is it actually conclude that it's equivalent to usual care. So if you're you know, thinking about this from a cost perspective, one of the challenges that we get is getting enough therapies for patients because it's expensive. So if you're you know, able to have a device where a patient can do therapies um, for you know, maybe a one-time capital investment, but then you can do as many therapies as you want for an extended period of time that you can actually achieve the level of therapies you want. Uh, some of these managed Medicaid plans give you 12 visits, whether you have a rotator cuff tear or a left MCA stroke. Uh, so I think you know, if you can achieve this goal with, with a, a similar device, I think that would be really helpful. Um, this is an area of, and all of these videos have bad music, my apologies. I, you are. Like, we we actually should uh, come up with theme music for our uh, for our rehab unit. So, let's see. So, you know, we've been using this more in our spinal cord population. Uh, the spinal cord injury patients love it. I mean, it's. I think it's more from a psychologic perspective. It's just amazing for them to be up and walking. It's a huge relief. Uh, you know, functionally, it's not necessarily the most functional device. Their wheelchair is usually much more functional. Uh, it's also, you know, seventy to eighty thousand dollars for these, so it's cost prohibitive. Um, but you can see where things may go eventually, right? Computers in the '60s are you know, very, very expensive, and then over time they become very, very cheap. If you, you can get a robot that even helps with one joint, maybe it's just... Oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, you know, if you can get a robot that helps with even one joint, um, whether it's, you know, just if you have a two of knee extension and you can move that to, you know, a four, that's enough to often make you functional. 
So if we can, you know, come up with the you know, solutions that are helping one joint and then build on that over time, I think we're going to be able to, to, to see real functional gains. And, and if we can reduce the cost, that would be exciting. So we're kind of still working out who we can actually use these in. So when you look at these robot-assisted gait rehabilitation programs, so this was a, a review of stroke patients. You know, everyone had significant improvements in Berg balance, um, you know, Tinetti, postural sway tests, and timed up and go tests, um, but really no differences between the intervention and control groups. So a therapist can achieve what you're achieving with this machine. Um, and, you know, I, I think we're, I, I wouldn't end research on this, but we're still trying to understand who to use this in. And, for example, one study looked at chronic stroke, six months rate of the outset, and then you know, patients with really poor Berg scales didn't do well uh, with this system. So you know, you're going to need someone that has a little higher Berg and trying to identify who those patients are. We've done a similar thing with spinal cord injury. Very high paras don't do very well with these rewalks if you're, you, know, you have to be kind of T6 or less to really be doing well. So I think a lot more is going to have to be worked out. The functional aspects, I think, are more interesting to me. Let me, I'll let you over talk, Connor. So you can see that, you know, designers are trying to make these devices so that they actually can fit on a person. There's no way you're going to wear that rewalk out to the mall. Um, but this is something that, you know, you could use in a daily life, may not be so constrictive or so prohibitive in terms of your function. And if you can get enough that you can now use that hand in a more functional way, then, you know, I think it's really rewarding for the patient. And, you know, I think what I'm also impressed at is the, the variety of thinking that's now occurring in this. We've been collaborating with the UW uh, uh, engineering department and technology department about how to build some uh, you know, prosthetic hands and using uh, surface EMG to, to manipulate not just hands but other devices around your house um, as a way to be more functional. And uh, you know, here's, a, here's an example of very functional for those that are severely disabled or both or very lazy um, if you wanted to get out in the world Not sure I want to see these going around everywhere, um, <laughs> but it's, I, I think a mine will be a drone. Um, the, you know, it, exactly, yeah. It, it's, but I think you get the idea of where you can go with this. And, I, you know, people are talking about building virtual spaces where people can meet and experience the world, um, you know, visit with family or do work, um, you know, without, you know, I, I think one of the things that I've appreciated for my patients is just how hard it is to leave the house, to make the trip to the doctor's office, you know, and then back, and they're completely exhausted by the end of the day, and I think it impairs their ability to follow up, and, uh, you know, having other ways to do that would be great. Um, So I wanted to show you one of the things that we've been working on. Um, let me see. Is, are, would you be willing to uh, volunteer? Sure. I do. It's okay, to, but she's just so tired. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so yeah, come here. And I'll probably have to log back in. So this is a company that built a virtual therapy environment. And you know, we've all heard of we sorry. Uh, we have and you know, kind of gaming approaches. Oh. I changed the password again. I think the difference in this system is that the we have is really not designed for actual therapies. You ready? Yeah, you're in the right spot. Whereas this is actually designed with the function of the patient in mind. So, and they just did an update. Yeah, come about right there. Great. Raise your hand again. Oh, straighten up. Yeah, keep facing. Now move your hand out to the side. So, and then try to go to 90. Yeah, pretty good. So it's measuring our angles. So this system is reading where the joints are in space and reading um, you know, what your body is doing in real time. So we're going to shut down this module. We're using this that particular module in um, in some of our burns uh, studies. What we've actually let's do something fun. Mm -hmm. So lift your hand up to begin. Yeah. <laughs> so now, yeah, go through the post. Oh. <laughs> Squat down. Oh, uh, you're doing okay. I think I think you're good enough to go higher. No, no, keep going. We're, we're this is just way too easy for you. We're gonna actually get you some therapy down. Oh. Good job. All the way to the right. Oh no. Yeah. Oh, this is not your game. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're getting it. Um, and then what's what I think is we'll do one more I think and then um, we could do yeah I think extra patients probably <laughs> that ma yeah anyway. so this pretend like your left arm is a little paritic um, so don't lift it all the way up lift it to where you could. There you go, and then down. Yeah, so it senses how far the patient can lift their arm and will push them within your set goals of how much range you want them to achieve. Um, so now you move it, pretend like you're a little critic here too. Don't go quite as far. Yeah, a little bit more maybe. Yeah. So now you lift your arm up and you control this fish and it will go to the green stuff. Yeah, you're actually on. And then you can customize what shapes you want, how much of their functional reach that you want to achieve. So if I want to go 90%, his is pretty narrow right now because we've pretended that he's paretic. Um, we can do, when someone has more range, this, is, this pattern is much bigger and so that they're having to go much further distances. Yeah, it pushes you to the end of your range so that you're working at the maximum. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Oh. Uh, we have a, we, uh, we have, like, no reward. She does sometimes tell you you're doing well, but usually she tells you you're not doing so well. She's, uh, but what it also gives me as a clinician is all the performance data. So. This is like big brother for rehab. Like I can actually tell what my patients are going to be doing because um, that you know, having done my own share of rehab, and you know, I, there was a few sessions I may have skipped here and there. Um, and I think you know, it really helps me to know what the interventions are. I think also in a research perspective, very granular data on what 
we're actually doing in these patients. So all these critiques of these earlier studies, like, so what are we doing? We're doing black box therapies for an hour. We can actually say we're doing, you know, this range of motion for this many times at this interval, uh, which, you know, I don't know if that will help or not, but I would like to have more information on that. Um, yeah, and I think the other thing I've noticed is that patients love it. So we had a lady on the rehab floor, we were having trouble getting her to stand for more than two or three minutes. And there's this game on here called the whack-a-mole. <laughs> she was there 30 minutes and we were like, okay, we're done. No, <laughs> she did not want to be done. She wanted to keep going. So she was up 30 minutes, 10 times what she'd ever achieved before that. And it was just purely motivation. And if you've ever done therapies, it, it, it's deadly dull. So if you can find another way to motivate patients, it's, it's a great way to do it. Um, I think I'm going to have to, I, we, did, we did pilot this on our rehab floor and found that patients um, really did enjoy the therapies. Uh, we did 20 patients. Um, most of them were using assistive devices, TBI or stroke. We did 280 of the modules. No falls or fall-related injuries, and there were some step-outs that required contact guard assistance at about 10%. So we're not convinced this is something you should be doing on your own at home, uh, depending on the module. Um, some mild elevations, but no medical in, in, in vitals, but no medical uh, uh, complications. And patients really liked it. I, I kept encouraging patients to be as harsh on their their uh, surveys as possible, but they, they actually really enjoyed it and would often ask to come back to do it. Um, we initially had some issues with feasibility, the technical errors because of the walkers, all the equipment around us, and we're still struggling with this in the ICU setting a little bit, but that's the, the company's done a great job of incorporating that. Um, it's not as great with fine motor. It's really more gross motor. Um, and it's not great supine. We tried it in ICU beds. It just doesn't get it. So uh, it's a little tough with trach tubes and things like that, uh, but it can it, it can work. Um, we're now enrolling in the ICU early mobilization and in the burn rehab. Um, uh, it's actually a burn unit, but we're doing burn rehabilitation of it. And we eventually would like to conduct an RCT. So I'm sorry I had to quickly go through the last part, but. Uh, Thank you for joining us. I think you know we're we're seeing some great uh, new uh, changes in rehabilitation, and our goal is to obtain better functional outcomes for our patients with stroke. So, great. What questions? For a sexual tumor, I've read about some device that will kind of counteract the that will, of the tremor. And I've seen that. I've not read the studies on it or, or done any uh, data on that. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's, it's basically real time, just keeping the tremor from, from happening as, as, as it's counting on to it. I haven't seen it used clinically yet, so. I just have a question about uh, your personal experience with traumatic brain injury for patients, since it's a much different yeah. Sure. The the question is uh, comparing uh, you know my personal experience with traumatic brain injury in inpatient versus uh, a skilled nursing facilities, and I the the one you know traumatic brain injury is is such a diffuse uh, or a, a diverse population um you know the, our real challenge is the walking wounded who are physically actually quite okay um, but cognitively very impaired um, who don't meet qualification for inpatient rehabilitation um, oftentimes end up going to skilled nursing facilities uh, the the in terms of the more severely brain injured with true, you know, polytrauma or motor neuro or, or motor deficits, um, I, I think it's very similar to stroke that they do better um, in inpatient rehabilitation. We've had a couple of patients who have had bilateral, uh, you know, or or 
three-limb non-weight bearing precautions who are sent to skilled nursing facilities and you know they they don't manage agitation they don't manage um, all the other sequelae like endocrine uh, dysfunction depression all of those issues very well uh, spasticity so we had one person who you know basically probably could have walked but ended up being contracted down because no range of motion was done um, so I, I find that the, the interventions in skilled nursing facilities as a whole are not adequate. And often, uh, the other thing that I find with skilled nursing facilities is therapies are listed but not done, um, which I, I find very disturbing. Um, the other thing about skilled nursing facilities is that, you know, the physician oversight is very remote. You know, they're not, they don't have to be there daily. They don't spend a lot of time with patients, um, which is okay in some populations, but in complicated polytraumas, complicated TBI with active behavioral issues, it, I think it's they're poorly served there. They're not always No, they don't have, they can be internal med, they can be, they can have no experience with any of it. Yeah, I, you know, I do encourage patients to, I, to a couple of things. One, when you're starting to hit that nadir of, of rehab, you know, where your PT and OT and other interventions are really not getting you more of a boost, I encourage a few things. So, and I actually tend to go the non-technological route. So people trying to find adaptive sports or adaptive activities that they can do, I find people get good functional gains from adaptive yoga or you know, whatever it is, biking, skiing, whatever they're trying to choose. Um, in terms of technologies, uh, you know, the, the Pokemon Go I just learned about last month, so I'll have to get back to you on that. I caught a resident playing it. And <laughs> that was, um, but the, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you guys have caught a, caught a few. Uh, but I do, you know, I think sometimes games are serious stuff. People tend to think of games as play, um, but play often is how we learn and how we develop. And you know, I have not known a single great, uh, you know, professor, or, you know, or athlete or anyone who didn't have interests that I think propelled them. Music, art, all of these things I think are actually a huge part of us and help us to learn and grow. So you know, when people say that they're non-essentials, I, I, I really. You know, I, I challenge them to identify great people that don't have those aspects. Yeah. So, um, this was a while ago, but Albert Love um, published this paper showing weight motor recovery in chronic stroke before you use the robotic devices to compare that to conventional therapy and intensive therapy. The robotic assist was not um, superior to conventional therapy, but intensive therapy was, was better. I was really excited about that uh, I never heard a lot about that. Um, more intensive therapy for chronic stroke to, to achieve. Yeah, I think, and I think the, the problem is the pairs with trying to get on, ongoing intensive therapy. You know, if you're doing three hours of therapy a day, that's $600 a day. And if you're trying to do that for months and months and months, the cost goes way up. And that's part of why I try to, I encourage people to find other activities where they're really getting therapies in other ways that they're not thinking about. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, like the connecting would be a great way to implement and, that. Because, uh, and that that's the yeah. that's exactly the RCT I want to run is to get this home with people so and to see how much of our therapies we're actually delivering to these patients. Um, you know, if you can take this box home with you and you have a game you like or you have an environment that you want to interact, then maybe you're you know maybe you're able to get more. Uh, therapy delivered to patients because I, I I really doubt a lot of my patients are being systematic in their you know their approach to therapies. It, there's only so many times you can lift a peg between a board you know or you know do the the range of motion exercises. It it you know I I'm cross country runner mountaineer did all that stuff and it was so hard to do those repetitions over and over and over. So. I think you're right. If we can find a ways to deliver those therapies, it would be great. And that's one thing I think about the robotic therapies is you don't have to have a person that's running them. So I think 
that's that's another advantage that they can help deliver to you. So. Um, I, I they do rehab. I don't know if they're doing the connect. Yeah. They are. <laughs> I, I mean, I'll try. Thank you all.